حضرة الأولى بعنوان رؤية 2030 إعادة تصميم التعليم للمستقبل. Presenting it is Mr. Stephen Knowles. Mr. Stephen, he's a specialist, online media philosopher. He's also part of the National Research Council of Canada. His lecture will talk about Vision 2030, redesigning education for the future. Mr. Stephen. Thank you for welcoming me. It's a pleasure to be back in Riyadh. It's a pleasure to be able to address all of you here today. Thank you very much for the warm welcome that I've received. What I'd like to talk to you about today is the way education will be redefined in the future, and in particular, the steps that we need to take in order to meet this redesign of education. We're facing a new challenge, and this new challenge is with the automation of many functions that employees currently perform, and we heard about that in one of the earlier sessions today. The emphasis is going to switch from simple queries to dealing with more complex problems in the workplace and indeed even in the home. And so we're looking at different levels of analysis and different types of access to experts with greater autonomy. So in that scenario, I want to first look at what learning becomes. And you know, there are many ways of describing it, but I've decided to break it down into these three areas. Learning that is relevant, learning that is engaging, and learning that is personal. What do I mean by learning that is relevant? Well, learning as something that matters to you, something that is part of your work, something that is even sometimes part of your identity. Now, of course, there's learning that is any time, any place. That's a key element that's relevant. If it's not where it needs to be, it's not going to be very relevant. Again, as well, learning that isn't immediate useful for you is very often not perceived as relevant. Learning that is ubiquitous, what I mean by that is thinking of learning as something that is always available, not something that you have to stop and go do, but learning that is available when and where you need it, appropriate to the time and the setting. Learning that is context aware, that is to say, Learning that knows who you are, what language you speak, what educational background you have, but also learning that is aware of your situation. If I'm looking to learn about the city that I'm in, the learning that I'm accessing should know what city that I'm in, for example. Learning that is problem focused. This is one of the major differentiators between formal training and informal online learning. Formal training is focused on a domain, a problem domain, but online informal learning is typically focused on a specific problem, trying to solve something, getting something done. And so learning that is context aware is going to be learning that is focused on what you are trying to do now. Case study of, of this sort of relevant learning is mobile learning, and of course, it's uh, something that we're doing more and more. I have my phone, you have your phones, we all have our phones. Designing learning for a device like this, it isn't just a matter of designing learning for a smaller screen, it's designing learning that is location aware, it's designing learning that has content that can be used in a mobile setting, accessing the image structure around, accessing the Wi-Fi, accessing GPS, accessing location-specific applications. 
In other cases, it's content recommendations. There's a popular story that talked about how Netflix delivers you Western movie after Western movie if you've watched just one Western movie in your lifetime. As technology improves, as learning becomes more personal and more relevant, our content recommendations depend more and more on factors such as collaborative filtering, cognitive modeling, etc. This is where artificial intelligence will play a role in the future of learning. But also learning is going to become more engaging. It will draw you in more. What do I mean by engaging? Well, I like to think of it as basically defined by two properties. First of all, it's learning that is immersive, and that's the obvious aspect of engaging. But it also means learning that is wanted, and that's a key element. It doesn't matter how immersive learning is, I'll just get the microphone there. It doesn't matter how immersive learning is, if you don't want it, it's not very engaging. The, to me, the, the, the key indicator here is, do we believe we're there? Do we actually believe we're in that learning environment? Well, what do I mean by diversity? I think, you know, I mean, when we hear definitions, you know, all the big uh, virtual reality or robots or things like that, and stuff, some of those, but really, immersive learning comes down to presence. Presence of uh, my colleagues uh, Archer, Anderson, and Garrison have defined three types of presence that are relative to learning, relevant to learning social presence, cognitive presence, teaching presence. Social presence, the environment of other people that you're in, cognitive presence, the ability of making meaning or creating a model of your, your environment, and teaching presence, the idea that. There's someone who can lead you and support you in learning something more. But most of all, presence is the idea that there is a person at the other end of the interaction. This is one of the dangers that virtual reality will face. If there's no person there, if you're only interacting with a computer simulation, then really it's just a toy. If you want, learning that is genuinely immersive, that means that there needs to be other people in the interaction. That creates this sense of presence, that creates this sense of immediacy. Learning that is wanted is learning that helps you do things. I like to think of that in terms of affordances. An affordance of a tool or a piece of software is what that tool or piece of software can do, or more importantly, what it can allow you to do. A lot of technology generally, e-learning specifically, is designed for a specific end use case. But I like to design with the the possibility or the capacity of something new, being able to do something new in mind, without trying to predict precisely what is going to be done. Affordances are created by technologies that are open-ended, that allow for many possibilities, that do not direct you down a specific route. And so you see how technology that is immersive can involve other people, can be open-ended. These are the kind of technologies that draw you in. The next major aspect of what technologies will become is technologies will be personal. Technologies, learning technologies especially, will be learning from the point of view of the person who is the learner. This is a very hard step for companies and for educational institutions to get past. Because very often, we define learning in terms of what we want the other person to do, to learn whatever. 
But personal learning is learning designed for and around the needs of the individual. We can approach it in different ways. We can think of the confidences, we can think of the support, or iteration, or opportunity. These are all aspects of personal learning. Competencies, you've heard a lot of talk about the competencies. A competency is a skill or a capacity that you are able to achieve that can be measured with some sort of standard or indicator. We're moving from task specific competencies to general interpersonal um, and self management competencies overall in learning. And these are the ones that are developed in a more open personal learning environment. Support and iteration, I often distinguish between personal learning and personalized learning. Personalized learning is learning directed toward a specific outcome. And then you're tested and you're found to be filling the gap. Personal learning, on the other hand, is learning, as I mentioned earlier, where you're trying to do something, where you're trying to accomplish something. And then each cycle of learning is an iteration in that attempt to do something. And the role of the educator or the educational software is to support you or to help you accomplish your goal. Think of personal learning plans, for example. On the one hand, you might think of a personal learning plan as a pathway to get to the specific learning outcome. Like achieving a degree or mastering a certain discipline. But a personal learning plan in informal learning more often involves learning what you need to do in order to accomplish the result, to install and use a piece of software perhaps, to manage to do a presentation like this one perhaps. Whatever it is that you as an individual are attempting to accomplish. Personal learning is very often accomplished by being shown rather than being told. And this is a, a bad environment to talk about being shown rather than being told because here I am telling you stuff. But what people who are trying to get something accomplished are looking for very often in learning is to be shown how to think strategically, say or shown how to reframe an issue. I often talk of the role of the educator as someone who does not tell, but rather someone who models and who demonstrates the application of a principle or a skill. Okay, that was a quick, rush look at how learning is changing. Possibly the more important segment of this talk is how do we, as providers of learning opportunities and learning resources, provide that? And again, it's divided into three major areas. The resources themselves, the environment in which learning takes place, and the assessment of learning, which is always a big concern to educational institutions. So let's begin by looking at the resources themselves. Traditionally textbooks, traditionally lectures and classrooms, traditionally perhaps videos or audio. But these are beginning to change. They used to be provided by publishers and vendors, but now we're seeing more and more open educational resources, open data, personalized learning practices, let me talk about these briefly. Open educational resources, you're probably aware of them already. People have been talking about them now for 15 years. They are resources that are created with the intention of being freely shared and freely reused by people in the educational community. To me, what is significant about open educational resources is not using them, but creating them. 
And when I'm involved in an educational activity, I prefer to have the participants, the learners of that activity, engaged in creating resources in that shared organization. We're also seeing a change in the nature of these resources. This is a whole talk right here. When I talk about open data and data parts, our resources that we're beginning to use in the future are not static resources anymore. They are uh, notebooks or workbooks that actually contain computer code. They actually contain programming functionality so that a person can use one of these not just to read about something, but to manipulate it and see how changing the code, changing the program, changes the outcome. A good example of this is called the Jupyter Notebook. This is an interactive notebook. You distribute it, and then people work with the code to learn from themselves using the notebook. There's personalized learning practices. And again, I don't like the word personalized here, but the idea of these practices is important. Again, we are moving from an environment of learners being passive receivers to an environment where learners create, share, and do. And this means that our practices as educators need to be supportive of that. They need to be supportive of the idea that people are creating and sharing. So instead of broadcasting, in a real person session, we move the broadcast on to one side and our classroom for our personal time with the learner is for the purposes of interaction, communication, discussion. And that means for us providing the technology and the infrastructure in order to support two way and multi way communication. Remember, it's about the person at the other side of the interaction. And without this interaction, we, we cannot support that. There's a, a case here of, of modeling different types of student inquiry. And the idea or the objective is to take them from structured inquiry, which is what characterizes our educational practices today, as they progress, as we progress, to more and more uh, controlled inquiry, guided inquiry, always with the ultimate objective of reaching free inquiry, where the learner no longer needs our direct instruction or support, where they're able to conduct their own inquiry and manage their own projects, including learning projects for themselves. I like to say that the role of the instructor, the role of the educational institution, is to make themselves unnecessary, to make themselves redundant. The less the individual relies on us to teach them, the more able they are to cope with and manage in a dynamic and changing environment. Another major aspect of learning resources is performance support. Again, this is the idea of learning as helping us accomplish a specific goal or a specific objective. I like to use this example. I used to use the example of a fishing rod, but then they actually built this tennis racket. This tennis racket doesn't simply enable you to play tennis. This tennis racket teaches you how to play tennis. You see, it, it has sensors, probably in an angle there, so when you swing the racket, it measures the swing, it measures the impact of the ball on the tennis racket, etc. And it gives you feedback, it interacts with your, with your mobile phone, say, and it gives you feedback and it tells you, oh, you're over-swinging, you're under-swinging, whatever. This is performance support. This is learning that helps you in the moment to support the performance. Now, if you think about the sort of infrastructure that's required, 
in order to do this, they get a sense of where Earth is headed for the future. We need real time, context, context aware sensors to feedback coming into the system and then providing this kind of support so the resources, you know, the, the things that the traffic safe says to you, uh, are immediately relevant and immediately useful. The next aspect is learning environments. Uh, learning environment, this is, you know, typically when we think of environments, physical environments like, like this, this beautiful hall, but learning environments online are an increasingly important system. Typically, we follow the learning environment as the learning management system where you are guided and directed through step by step through instruction. But more and more, we're looking at open ended environments with more possibilities. So, we're going through a progression from learning platforms to internet, things, social learning. Etc. I'll talk about each of these in turn briefly. So the learning platforms that we're familiar with are changing from management systems to systems that access resources and services from third parties. There's a technology called L2I, Learning Tools Interoperability. It's an IMS standard. It makes this sort of capacity possible. Learning platforms, this is an example of something that I worked on in the Canada School of Public Service. They used not just one simple tool to provide learning for uh, public service in Canada, but they used a learning management system, a content management system, specifically Drupal. They used Moodle as a learning management system as well to allow their instructors to create learning materials on an as needed basis. They also used Kaltura to provide access to video resources and then what they called the service bus that connected them all together. And what we were looking at was connecting all of this with something called GC Collab, Government of Canada Collaboration which is basically a social network that links Canadian public servants with members of the academic and professional community in Canada. So all of this was connected to an institutional social network. The Internet of Things will play an increasing role in providing these learning environments. Again, don't think of online learning as learning in front of the computer. Think of online learning as learning where you are surrounded by digital tools that help monitor and support your learning. We're seeing more and more of these digital tools, everything from the magic bands that Disney developed to complex sensors and performance measuring devices. Social learning, as I mentioned, in the School of Public Service is becoming more important. And in order to support social learning, it's not about, again, creating scripted interactions. It's about creating an open ended environment, open networks, open standards, in order to facilitate communication with other people, no matter which device they're using on. I like to say, you know, allowing uh, Android to talk to Apple, allowing Apple to talk to Android. There are technologies that can be developed in order to support this kind of interaction. Learning tools and cooperability, which I mentioned earlier. Application programming interfaces or APIs. And if you're looking for things to, to watch for in this area, look for JavaScript on object notation, or JSON. That's the format that is commonly used to support these interactive environments. Again, with the uh, School of Public Service that I was talking about earlier, we have resource integration, common services, and learning tools, interoperability, in order to create this overall environment of learning. Finally, we make use of cloud applications and storage in order to facilitate this. This is what makes it possible to 
for learning to be used by any device at any time. You put the resources in the cloud and use the tool to access the resource. The last topic of the talk is assessment. And in assessment, what I'm thinking of specifically is beginning with assessment of competencies and skills, but ultimately assessment that looks beyond the learning experience and looks at the performance itself. Mm -hmm. This is true of competencies and skills. We can look at whether you master the competency in the classroom, but where we're more interested is whether you've mastered and whether you actually employ the, the competency in the work environment. So we want to look at ways of measuring performance in the work environment and bringing that back into the learning environment. Well, what does that look like? Advanced Distributed Learning is working on a program called Competencies and Skills Systems. They're using a data format called XAPI, Experience API, in order to track activities and bring them back into a learning record system. Here's the learning record system, and it can be encoded in various ways. But even going beyond that is the idea of the quantified self, and sometimes I even talk about the qualified self. This is the idea of the individual learner measuring their own performance, not for the purpose of a third party assessment, but, but for the purpose of a personal improvement. A person, for example, who tracks when they go to cycle or running is doing quantified self. They measure their own activity and use that feedback in order to compare themselves to their own previous performance. This finally involves feeding forward and sharing the resource, sharing the learning with other people. This has been a very brisk half hour, and I thank you for your time. I wish we had more time together, but I hope this gives you a taste if you want to find out more information about any of these or about the course that I'm offering on some of these right now, there is my website. Thank you very much, Chaprav. I hope to see you again.